Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 17, Archaic Art and Architecture. Although its name archaic denotes old-fashioned and second-rate, many art historians will maintain that archaic art is in fact superior even to that of the classical period. There is no doubt, at any rate, that in art, as well as in literature, philosophy, and science, archaic Greece experienced a burst of creative energy unsurpassed in any comparable time period of the ancient world. In fact, some scholars refer to this time period as the Greek Renaissance, because this period developed the art and intellectual thought that Greece is known for. Through their reconnection with the Near East and colonization, the Greeks learned very important and valuable things and adapted them to produce something completely extraordinary. The next few episodes will deal with those achievements. Since today's episode will be about archaic art and architecture, I recommend that while listening to this episode, you also view the images on the accompanying website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com so you can see what I'm describing. Progression from the geometric style that was common throughout the 9th and early 8th centuries BC to a more representational approach occurred in the late 8th century BC. As scenes from Greek legends increasingly became popular, painted on vases and engraved on metalwork. Near Eastern influence on art appears especially prominent. Like the borrowing of the alphabet, this so-called orientalizing period of Greek art exemplifies the importance of the Near East in the development of Greek culture. As in the case of writing, what the Greeks learned from the Near East, they increasingly transformed into a distinctly Hellenistic expression. They copied their different styles and motifs with floral designs, human figures, and real and imaginary animals instead of just geometric designs. There are scenes of warfare and the hunting of wild beasts, as well as the first pictorial representations of myth in painting and sculpture. Clearly, Greek artists were beginning to realize that the culture of the day demanded representational expression. The unrestrained exuberance of this new artistic spirit is also evident in the increase of distinctive regional, local, and even individual styles, as craftsmen from all over Greece experimented with, mixed, copied, adapted, and abandoned in rapid succession both homegrown and imported styles and techniques. Orientalizing influences on vase painting can be seen as early as the 8th century BC, but it reached a peak during the 7th century BC. Several episodes ago, we discussed the popularity of geometric art in Athens. Well, Corinth too produced a geometric style of pottery in the 8th century BC, but it lacked both the figural decoration and the longevity of that at Athens. Thus, Corinthian vase painters were more receptive to these influences and produced a very distinctive type of pottery. Athens, meanwhile, was less receptive and much more conservative artistically. Thus, this period is subdivided into Proto-Corinthian or Proto-Attic from around 725 to 625 BC and Corinthian or Attic Black figure around 625 to 550 BC, as those were the two leading pottery manufacturers of their time. Under the leadership of the Kypsilids, Corinth emerged as the leading commercial center of Greece and dominated the trade in finely painted pottery. Corinthian potter specialized in exquisitely decorated perfume flasks, two to three inches high, called Eribalus, which they filled with scented olive oil and exported in huge quantities throughout the Greek world. Other popular shapes were the olpe, a broad lip jug, the oenokoi, another pouring vessel, and the kotule, a cup. Many of these pots were exported to southern Italy and Sicily. The discovery of pot shards of Corinthian pottery in the lowest levels of the colonial sites has helped to provide the dates for the pottery types. It also shows the extent and intensity of the Corinthian trade network at this time. Corinthian pottery was copied widely in the West, appearing as a style known as Italo-Corinthian. At first, the figures were drawn either in the old-fashioned geometric silhouette manner or an outline. But then the Corinthians invented a new technique, called black figure, which permitted them to render minute details more easily. A vase would be sculpted by one individual, and then painted by another. Sometimes, it was done by just one person. After the vase was sculpted, a glaze was applied, where the black coloration was supposed to be located. Then it was fired in the kiln and left set to allow the oxygen to escape, which turned the vase completely black. Once the kiln was opened, all the areas not covered with the glaze returned to their previous color. The artist then painted a black silhouette on the reddish clay, and then with a sharp needle-like instrument, he incised the decorative details, sometimes filling these in with red or white paint. 
The common animals employed were panthers, lions, boars, bulls, birds, dogs, and mythological creatures. Human figures appear much less frequently than animals, but two vases from the mid-7th century BC display warriors in action. We discussed in episode 13 the Chigi vase, an ope which represented hoplite warriors engaging in the phalanx against each other for the first time. Another depiction can be seen on the so-called Macmillan Eribalis, located at the British Museum. It is very small, only about two and a half inches high, as it was a perfume flask. The upper part is rendered as a lion's head. There is a luxuriant floral design on the shoulder, but the body shows striding and collapsing warriors in combat. The hoplites aren't shown in a phalanx, however, but on a single plane, with no thought of perspective. Not only are these vases important in military history, as they show the beginning of the ascendancy of drilled foot soldiers over cavalry, but they also exemplify, both in terms of technique and style, the very best of Proto-Corinthian vase painting. Proto-Corinthian black figure was enormously popular, but as often happens, success led to mass production in inferior vases. Thus around 625 BC, the Proto-Corinthian style gave way to the full-blown Corinthian style. Orientalizing animals and mythological beasts were still used, but they were now enlarged and carelessly repeated. They also began to clutter the background. Proto-Attic pottery, meanwhile, only began to move away from the geometric style into the black figure technique towards the end of the 7th century BC. It did not have the same popularity as Proto-Corinthian and was rarely found abroad. The amphora and crater continued to be the most important Attic shapes, though the oenokoi and skiphos, a two-handed drinking cup, were also popular. The smaller shapes were actually imported from Corinth, a preference that hampered local production. Thus, painted scenes are much larger than in Proto-Corinthian, continuing in the Attic geometric tradition, with the focus more geared towards human figures. There was also an increasing interest in mythology. A huge amphora from around 650 BC, found at Eleusis, and thus referred to as the Eleusis Amphora, depicts the Gorgons in pursuit of Perseus in the main body. The hero had just decapitated their sister Medusa and was making off with her head. The majority of Perseus's body is fragmentary and thus has been chipped off. However, the scene on the neck is what makes the vase famous. Odysseus and two of his companions are driving a stake into the eye of Polyphemus, the Cyclops who had imprisoned them in his cave, in the Odyssey. Another famous example is the Nessus Amphora. Like that of the Eleusis one, there are gorgons around the body, but these are more pronounced as the black figure technique was gaining popularity by 625 to 600 BC in Attica. Perseus, however, is not shown. Once again, the famous scene is on the neck, showing the struggle between Heracles and the centaur Nessus. It is seen as a transition between the proto-Attic and Attic black figure. As we mentioned in a previous episode, the earliest Greek architecture was made out of wood or mud brick, both of which were not durable. But after their encounters with the Egyptians, the Greeks would learn how to quarry, transport, position, and dress huge stone blocks and began to construct architecture in limestone and then marble. Most Greek temples were oriented astronomically. Scholars can use remains of stone foundations and fragments of stone columns to reconstruct the basic plan of the earliest Greek temples. In addition, there are a few surviving temple models in terracotta from the 8th century BC. Earlier temples are rectangular shaped, with a door on one end that was sheltered by a projecting porch, called Apisthodomos, and it was supported by two posts. A large main room was called a cella, or naus, and a small reception area, or vestibule, was called the pronaus. Additionally, the temple was also called naus in ancient Greek. Semantically different from Latin, templum. The front of the temple was called the facade. All of this wasn't too different from the plan of the Mycenaean Megaron. But the low-pitched roof, covered with terracotta tiles, which replaced the old-fashioned roof, was a purely Greek design. Since the technique of building arches or vaults was not perfected until Roman times, in a Greek building, the roof had to take the form of horizontal beams and slabs supported at right angles by vertical walls or columns. Above these, the temple's roof usually rose gently from either side to a ridge running from the front to the rear of the building, called a pediment. This left a triangular area above the end columns on the porch. Thus, in this way, the characteristic straight outlines of a Greek temple were partly dictated by practical considerations. 
The earliest surviving temples of the Archaic period are much more complex than their geometric counterpart. Its rectangular cella was surrounded by a row of columns on all sides, called peristyle from the Greek root peri, which means around, and style refers to the columns. Thus, it's called a peripteral temple. There could be multiple rows of columns forming covered walks or colonnades. Their arrangement and number varied from temple to temple, though, as one might expect, there was a steady trend away from the simplicity of the early times towards more complicated designs as time progressed. Yet the basic rectangular ground plan remained standard, with very few exceptions. Their great love of symmetry also often led the Greeks to place a dummy porch at the back of the temple to match the real one at the front. The whole temple was raised up on a platform consisting of a stereo bait, or the lower level of the platform that stepped up to the stylobate, upon which the columns of the temple stood. Ancient Greek temples functioned as a place of worship, but the purpose of the temple was not, as in the Christian church, to hold large congregations. The altar was outside, and any gathering of worshippers, perhaps for a sacrifice, could take place there. The interior, though, was closed off to all non-priests or priestesses, and was believed to be the actual home for that deity. There also was a large statue of that deity found in an unlit interior chamber, called the Adaton. Suitable offerings to the deity also could be kept in the nous. Within archaic Greek architecture, there are two main forms of orders, Doric and Ionic. The Doric order was common in the Peloponnese and the Doric colonies. Similarly, the Ionic order takes its name from Ionia, where some of the earliest temples of this style were built. There are several major differences between the Ionic and Doric orders. First and foremost, they are differentiated in the appearance of their capitals, which is the top part of the columns, and their pediments, which is the triangular part of the temple. Doric order is very severe, massive and durable, with its capital being a linear and flat slab, called the abacus. There are echoes here of Egyptian, Mycenaean, and Minoan columns. Ionic order is lighter and more ornamental, with its capital consisting of two rounded volutes with palmette designs in between. Basically, Ionic capitals have scrolls on both sides. Fluting refers to the grooves in the columns. Doric has wider grooves, while the Ionic has thinner and more elongated ones. Also, the Ionic has bases for columns that sit on a stylo bait, while the Doric does not. Finally, the Ionic frieze is a continuous band rather than broken up between triglyphs and metopes as in the Doric frieze. Although the Doric order was invented first, the Ionic order did not replace Doric, and indeed elements of both styles could be combined in the same building, for example the Parthenon, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. By the mid-7th century BC, Greek temples were being constructed with the Doric order of design, having large dressed stones and columns roughly six diameters high, crowned with square stone abacuses and carrying smooth stone beams with a further vertical face above. Some parallels to Egyptian architecture are present, but it's doubtful that the Doric design had Egyptian origins. Greek engagement with Egypt, initially via Carian and Ionian mercenaries, only became significant after the mid-7th century BC, during the reign of the pharaoh Samatikos. Thus, such a date would only allow tight timing for the transmittal and widespread assimilation of Egyptian architectural techniques onto the Greek mainland, which doesn't seem plausible. Doric temples also had new, non-Egyptian elements, including the use of terracotta roof tiles, which can be only used on a shallow slope, giving the Greek temples their distinctive profile. The earliest known Doric temple is that of Apollo at Corinth, built by Periander around 600 BC. But the style caught on, and similar temples soon were constructed to Artemis at Sparta, Hera at both Argos and Olympia, and Athena at Smyrna in Ionia. The Doric temple with the oldest remains today are that of Hera at Olympia, built around 590 BC. The temple is in ruins, as it was destroyed in the 4th century AD by an earthquake. Three large columns, though, have been restored and erected in their original locations. The columns were originally wooden but were gradually replaced by stone. Many centuries later, Pausanias reports that there was still an oak column standing in the Pistodomos, confirming that this temple was transitional in terms of building materials. Better preserved is the Temple of Apollo at Corinth. It was rebuilt around 560 BC after an earthquake felled its earlier model. Seven of its columns still stand, with an architrave block still in place. The columns are monolithic, meaning they were carved from a single quarry block, and were made of limestone. 
Between 580 and 550 BC, many major Greek temples were being constructed outside of the Greek mainland, in cities such as Naxos in the Cyclades, Corsaira in the Adriatic, Metapontum and Locri in southern Italy, Syracuse, Selinus, and Gela in Sicily, Ephesus, Didyma, and Samos in western Anatolia, and Cyrene in North Africa. With the exception of Ephesus, this was probably a case of Greek colonists on the frontiers wanting to both impress their neighbors and reinforce their identity through monuments that connected them to the larger Hellenic world. The Temple of Hera I at Poseidonia, or Paestum, in southern Italy, is one of the earliest surviving temples still standing, dating to around 540 BC. It's called Hera I to differentiate it from the later Hera II, built during the Classical period. Another standing surviving temple is the smaller one to Athena, dating to around 500 BC. Their thick mass of columns appear to respond to the weight of the capital by widening and bowing out in the center, a process called entasis. Planners introduced a number of refinements into the architecture from time to time, and this temple provides the earliest example of this type of curvature on the face of a building. By this point, Greek temples looked much as they would for the next 500 years, but these temples weren't just shining displays of marble that we see now. They were painted in bright colors. Though the paintings are almost entirely lost to us, the artists who painted them were renowned beyond their polis, and some of their names were still remembered centuries later. During the 6th century BC, other carefully built permanent structures appeared in the main cities. Most of these were built in and around the agora, or gathering place, which was a large open space at or near the center of a polis. The Dark Age Agora had been only a place where the assembly met, but in the Archaic period it became the marketplace and public space of the city, and therefore of the whole city-state. Everyone gathered there to barter, exchange news and gossip, or conduct official business. By about 500 BC, the Agora contained one or more open colonnaded passageways, called stoas, which provided shade and shelter, and space for market stalls. Enhancing its dignity and importance were official buildings, such as the council house and other offices. Sanctuaries, fountain houses, and public monuments also graced the agora. In addition, archaic polis contained open spaces with specified functions, like the gymnasium, where the men exercised. The agora and other public spaces would not receive numerous or splendid public buildings until the classical period. Nevertheless, by about 550 BC, all the capital polis, except for Sparta, merited the title of true urban centers. An aerial view of Corinth or Athens, for instance, would have revealed a dense concentration of buildings, most of them private houses, connected in blocks along narrow streets, broken up by patches of garden plots. The houses were larger than those of the Dark Age, containing three or four rooms rather than one or two, but were still quite modest. Even the homes and furnishings of the nobles, including the tyrants, remained unpretentious throughout the Archaic period. The modesty of private homes and the relative modesty even of secular civic buildings underscores the basic fact that efforts towards architectural and sculptural distinction in ancient Greece were directed primarily towards sanctuaries. As the gods received the majority of Apollos' surplus wealth, both at home and in the Panhellenic sanctuaries. Another artistic development that testifies to the increase in wealth and organization of archaic Greek communities is the nature of offerings left in the temples. Typical dedications of the 8th century BC included large bronze tripods, jewelry, clothing, armor, weapons, exotic foreign items, and small bronze animal figurines. But in the early 7th century BC, human figures started to become the preferred gift to the gods, and even other votive offerings such as cauldrons, were increasingly adorned with human figures. Earliest such objects were obviously influenced by contemporary Egyptian style. They were overly stylized. Small bronze figurines, such as the Manticlos Apollo, dated to around 700 to 675 BC. It is an 8-inch figurine of a youth that shows cylindrical thighs, genitalia, and a triangular torso, and has a really long neck with a triangular face, facial characteristics, and braided hair. The figure is reduced to simple angular shapes, typical of the geometric style of the human form. There is an inscription on its side dedicating it to Apollo by an unknown person named Manticlos. 
The Greek world was also flooded with small mold-made and thus clearly mass-produced terracotta female figurines that had the same style, known as Daedalic, after the legendary sculptor Daedalus. The major centers of production seem to have been at Corinth, Crete, and Rhodes. A famous example of this style is the Lady of Oxair, dated to around 650 BC. It is two feet tall and made out of limestone, not terracotta. Although it is Cretan in origin, it is so named because it was found mysteriously in a museum in Auxerre, France, and now resides at the Louvre. Standing frontally, she wears a long dress, elaborately decorated with concentric squares. Scholars are not sure whether she is a representation of a mortal or a deity, since the Greeks made their deities appear as humans. She wears a cloak with the right hand over her heart, which could represent a gesture of prayer. However, goddesses typically held something in their hands and wore a headdress but those items could just be missing from the figurine. This figurine shows that a naturalistic approach is evolving with her breasts and clenched waist, but yet it still maintains geometric tendencies with her hair. By the end of the 7th century BC, a uniquely Greek artistic creation of life-size or larger sculptures of marble had become the temple offering of choice. The Greek statues were of two types, a naked kouros, or young male, and a clothed core, or young female, while Egyptian statues represented powerful individuals. These archaic Greek statues were intended to represent humans in the abstract. Their placement in temples, in ever-increasing numbers and sizes, seems designed to prompt thoughts on the relationship of man to the gods. Seeing their gods as having human form, there was no distinction between the sacred and the secular in art. After all, for the Greeks, the human body was both secular and sacred. Initially, all kuroi found in sanctuaries were once thought to have been a representation of Apollo, as their conspicuous size and appearance towered above most other gifts in the sanctuary. But that hypothesis lost favor after others were found in cemeteries. They were commissioned and dedicated by wealthy families to commemorate the death of a loved one, and in this way, they also could function as a grave marker, effectively replacing the geometric crater. Because they normally bore an inscription with the dedicator's name, they were public advertisements of the family's wealth and status in the community, and in this manner, they became expressions of competition between noble families. These early sculptures were extremely similar to Egyptian statues in pose and proportion. One of the earliest freestanding Kouros statues from Attica, the region around Athens, dating to around 600 BC, is now found at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It is about six and a half feet tall, and the Egyptian style is evident in his rigidness, having his one foot forward, his arms to the side, his clenched fists, and his overly stylized hair. But these type of statues also differ in a few critical aspects. Their weight is distributed as if they were in the act of walking, and they have muscle indentations in the chest, pelvis, and knees whereas the Egyptians usually wore clothes in theirs. The Greeks portrayed their statues in the nude. Since they were very interested in physical anatomy, it exemplified two important aspects of archaic art, an interest in lifelike vitality and concern with the design. This early kouros is characterized by geometricized features with its hair and muscles simplified with geometric patterns and lines. As time went on, these sculptures became increasingly less block-like and would come to resemble real youths with precisely defined anatomical details and accurate body proportions. Statues in the Archaic period were not intended to represent specific individuals. They were depictions of ideal beauty, piety, honor, or sacrifice. They were always depictions of young men, ranging in age from adolescence to early maturity, even when placed on the graves of presumably elderly citizens. Homer's poems give the impression that in heroic times, nudity signaled shame, death, and dishonor. But by this time, male nudity came to serve as the archetypal image of everything of the Greek ethos. That is youth, beauty, athletic success, military and civic virtue, immortality, since the gods had the human form, and sexual desirability. No other culture known to the Greeks allowed male nudity. Thus, to them, its practice marked the civilized Greeks off from the non-Greek barbarians. Although Kuroi became more naturalistic over time, and there are variations between regional workshops, 
They may have slight differences, but their basic characteristics are the same. For example, the twin statues found at the Sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi, dating to around 580 BC, and housed now at the Archaeological Museum of Delphi, have hair more reminiscent of the Daedalic style and shorter, stockier proportions. They have been identified as Cleobis and Biton, who in one of Herodotus's tales, took the place of the missing oxen and pulled their mother's carriage six miles across the plain of Argos to the sanctuary of Hera. Other scholars have preferred to identify them with the Dioscuroi, Castor and Pollux. A later Kuros is the statue of Croesus, dated to around 530 BC and found at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens. It represents a man who died in battle, not to be confused with the Lydian king Croesus. His family erected a statue in his honor, and there are inscriptions that tell about his bravery in battle. It's meant to be a representation of ideal male, youthful beauty, not necessarily what Croesus looked like. In his statue, a more naturalistic evolution occurs. The stone appears smoother, and his eyes, lips, and cheeks are more naturalistic. The blissful positioning of the lips is known as the archaic smile. There is more definition in the abdomen. The thighs are thicker, and the arms have loosened up slightly. The only real holdover is the bead-like treatment of the long hair. For some unknown reason, the core statues did not appear until a generation or so after the Kuros first appeared, though they had the same functions. A very early example of the female core statue is the so-called Berlin core, because it is housed at the museum in Berlin. Dating to around 570 BC, she is just as stiff and frontal as the New York Kuros, and similar with bulging bug-like eyes though her face is more proportionate. She displays the same archaic smile, which is accentuated with rounder cheeks. Like all Korai, this young woman is shown closed, reflecting the Greek custom of women not being nude in public. The folds in her clothing and skirt resemble the fluting of the Doric columns, making her seem extremely solid and stable. Unlike the Kuros, she does not stride forward. She also holds a pomegranate in her hand, a reference to Persephone, the daughter of the goddess Demeter who was abducted by Hades. When she was in the underworld, she ate some pomegranate seeds, and for every seed, she was forced to spend one month annually with Hades in the underworld. During this time, the saddened Demeter, the goddess of agriculture, made the earth barren, or winter, and when Persephone returned, spring occurred. As she prepared to head back to Hades, fall happened. In this way, the myth was representative of the seasons. The same naturalization occurs in the Korai statues as well, but the changes are measured more in terms of the rendering of the drapery than the anatomy. This can be seen in the Phrasiclia core, dated to around 540 BC, and so-called due to an inscription on her base. She is not wearing the large mantle any longer. The features of the face are smaller, and the proportions are slimmer than those of the Berlin core. She too also holds a pomegranate in her hand, and the jewelry worn is similar. The statue can be found at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens. Many examples continue to the end of the Archaic period throughout Greece, but there is a specially striking late Archaic series of 14 Korai statues from the Athenian Acropolis. It seems that rich dedications to Athena were popular during the tyrannies of Pisistratus and his sons. The Acropolis of Athens is one of the major sources of Archaic statuary, since the Persians had overturned everything in their onslaught in 480 BC. And after the war, the Athenians had gathered up the shattered remains and buried them tidily, making it easy for later archaeologists to discover. All 14 statues are housed at the Acropolis Museum. One of the most famous is the so-called Peplos Core, dating to around 530 BC. The maiden wears a garment in four layers. It could be an image of a goddess, but scholars are unsure. A Peplos refers to a long, woolen belted garment that is very old-fashioned. Pins were placed at the shoulders, and it was tied at the waist. She is much more rounded and feminine than the Berlin core. Her hair is still stylized, but falls in a much more believable way around her shoulders. And it's possible to get some sense of body beneath her garments, as we can see shapes of breasts, legs, and so forth. Her left arm is missing, but it would have been projected forward, and either carried a bowl or a vase for pouring out libation. By the mid-6th century BC, other types of statues were being produced in the round. Around 560 BC, the Moscophoros, or calf-bearer, was dedicated on the Acropolis at Athens. 
The bearded figure, whose beaded hairstyle is similar to the Kuroi, wears a thick cloak and carries a calf, his sacrificial offering, on his shoulders. It too can be found at the Acropolis Museum. Female figures, other than Korai, were appearing as well. One example is the Sphinx dedication at Delphi by the Naxians, who were one of the richest Cyclotic islands of the Archaic period. It consists of a colossal marble ionic column of about 40 feet high, with a female sphinx crouching atop. Sphinxes often appear in funerary contexts, protecting tombs, clearly Egyptian-influenced. The sphinx had the head of a woman, the body of a lion, and the feathers of a bird of prey, which are turned upward in this specific statue. It is housed at the Delphi Archaeological Museum. Another type of archaic sculpture was reliefs carved on the triangular pediments and along the entablatures of the late 6th century BC temples. They usually depicted mythological scenes associated with the deity of the temple. The architectural sculpture found between the top of the columns and the roof itself is called the frieze. If it was ionic, it would have been a continuous strip, but if the temple was Doric, it would have had a series of individual panels, called metapes. The latter was separated by stone slabs, decorated with three vertical grooves cut in them, known as triglyphs. These were the equivalent of the ends of the wooden cross beams of early temples. When stone replaced wood as the principal building material, they were kept as a traditional element of the temple's appearance. In addition, the triangular pediments formed by the shape of the roof at the ends of the temples were also filled with sculptures. It was difficult to fit the carvings naturally into the area available, and great skill was shown in finding ways of filling the awkward corners. Relief sculpture was increasingly successful at showing figures in movement and action. By contrast, the freestanding Kuroi and Korai must have appeared rather old-fashioned by the end of the century. The fragments of the Temple of Artemis at Corsaira, dating to around 600 to 580 BC, represent some of the earliest surviving sculpted pediments in Greek art. Carved in a series of separate limestone slabs, assembled in high relief, with undercutting behind the heads of the bodies of two lions, with a central medusa behind them, it appears to the viewer to break away from the surface of the pediment. It is augmented by the fact that Medusa's head overlaps a portion of the pediment frame. She was one of the three-winged female monsters, known as Gorgons, who had fangs, snaky hair, and wore snaky belts. They are extremely dangerous to look upon, as they turn the viewer into stone. According to one legend, she was slain by Athena, who then wore her skin, along with her head, as a protective mantle. In another legend, she was slain by the hero Perseus with the help of Athena. She gave him a highly polished shield as a mirror so that he could look at her and kill her without being turned to stone. He then gave the head to Athena, who placed it on her shield. Thus, the gorgon head was a popular decoration for a warrior's shield. The Greeks also used images of Medusa to protect other things, such as temples. Like the Egyptian style, she is depicted in a twisted perspective, with her legs sideways, and with a frontal torso and head. Flanking her are depictions of her two children, Pegasus on the left and Chryseor on the right, both of whom were born from the blood that gushed from her neck when she was slain. Pegasus was the famous winged horse that was caught and tamed by the hero Bellerophon. Chryseor was a giant who became the king of the Iberian Peninsula. On either side of them are two crouching lions. In addition to temples, architects also constructed smaller buildings called treasuries, to safeguard the offerings of individual cities and to stand themselves as offerings and marks of gratitude and devotion. At Delphi, for example, numerous states, including Sicyon and Sifnos, built treasuries during the Archaic period. Simple in plan, with a small rectangular cella preceded by a porch of often two columns, such treasuries were built with thick walls and raised on podiums. One of the earliest was the treasury of the Siconians. Built around 570 to 560 BC, either Cleisthenes or his successor Ascanius commissioned it. If you recall from last episode, it was Cleisthenes who led the force to free Delphi during the First Sacred War. Instead of the subject matter of typical Greek art of the time, that being Homeric content and the exploits of Heracles, its metopes emphasized myths special to Sicyon. Those of the Dioscori, 
the Caledonian Boar, and the Adventures of the Argonauts. Its stone foundation is all that remains, but several metopes can be found in the Delphi Archaeological Museum. The treasury of the Siphnians, built around 530 BC, also is no longer standing, and its sculpture fragments are too preserved at the Delphi Archaeological Museum. It was believed to be the most lavish of all treasuries, and was funded by gold and silver mines, controlled by Siphnos, and was an altogether different architectural order, being Ionic. The two columns of the porch were replaced by female figures carved in the round, known later to the Roman architect Vitruvius as Caryatids, but probably just called Cori at that time. Another city-state, Cnidos, had already built a treasury at Delphi with Caryatids in the porch, but the most famous example of this, the Erechtheon, on the Acropolis of Athens, was yet to come. We'll check back on that later when we get to the classical period. In any event, the pedimental sculpture from the rear of the treasury is fairly well preserved. The central figure of Zeus arbitrates between Heracles and Apollo, who struggle for the Delphic tripod. The two main subjects in the frieze were the Trojan War and the Gigantomachy, or the battle between the gods and giants, which we discussed in episode 2. The overlapping of the figures and animals makes this sculpture effective with a great variety of poses. Proportions are extremely muscular and solid in the legs and upper thighs, emphasizing their power. It would have been more dramatic in its original state when painted in multiple colors. As we have seen, based on their innovations in pottery art and Doric temple construction, as well as the popular Corinthian-style helmet favored by the Greek soldiers of the era, Corinth was clearly a city on the cutting edge of archaic development. But by the 6th century BC, Athens ascended and became the preeminent city-state, culturally and economically. Athenian potters had mastered Corinthian techniques and thanks to their high quality of clay, they grew into an important center for pottery production, beyond a regional significance, and quickly spread into Corinthian markets overseas, where Corinth had previously enjoyed a virtual monopoly. By the mid-6th century BC, Athenian black figure pottery featuring a variety of new and larger vessels, had surpassed Corinthian vases in the international market. Corinth, of course, continued to produce pottery for export, but the Athenian pots were preferred. Laconian vase painters also had local importance, but they were able to find some success abroad, especially at Taurus and Cyrene. For example, if you recall from two episodes ago, we mentioned the Arcesilus cup, which was manufactured in Laconia. It shows scenes of the Cyrenian king and offers us a rare glimpse of actual historical figures in Greek art. In the first half of the 6th century BC, Athenian painters continued to decorate their vases with animal friezes drawn from the Corinthian style, floral and palmettes of the Orientalizing style, and mythological stories. The Francois vase, dated to around 570 BC, represents the pinnacle in this style of Attic pottery. It is a large black figure crater that was sculpted by Cladius and painted by Ergotimos, identified by inscriptions. It was found in an Etruscan tomb and now resides in Florence. The Etruscans were always fond of Greek vases, and we can see that by now the Athenians were busy trading with the Etruscans and the Western Greeks, and were rapidly depriving Corinth of their markets. The crater is decorated with six different friezes and depicts over 200 mythological figures many with identifying inscriptions. Although the Greeks initially turned to the style and imagery of the Near East, Athenian black figure was then molded into something new in the last half of the 6th century BC. The images on the vase are not as crowded with the main scene being found on the body now. Two painters led the way in this endeavor from 540 to 530 BC, the so-called Amasis painter and Ezechias. The name Amasis is a Greek form of the Egyptian name Amose, so it is possible that he too was an Egyptian, or partly Egyptian. But there was also a preference for potters to use foreign aliases. In any event, his most important piece, known to us by his signature under its neck, is his Amphora of Dionysus and the two Maenads, located in Paris. The Maenads were worshippers of the god Dionysus, and were associated with frenzied drunken behavior that included bloodletting, sexual activity, and violence against animals and people. 
Dionysus is often identified holding a cantharos, a type of wine cup, and having an ivy wreath on his head, as seen on the vase. Here, the main ads are offering a rabbit or a small deer to the god as a sacrifice. Ezechius is widely thought of as the finest Athenian artist of the Archaic period. He signed many vases as both the potter and painter and was particularly known for his skillful portrayal of human emotion. Many of his works depicted events of the Trojan War. One such example is found in the vase depicting Achilles killing Penthesilea, located in the British Museum. Their eyes are locked onto each other at the moment of her death. Perhaps his best-known piece is the one of Achilles and Ajax playing a dice game, located at the Vatican Museum, as it was also found in Etruria. It took place just before Achilles' death, in which Ajax carried his body from the battlefield, and it would have been a subject familiar to the Greeks. Seemingly peaceful, the scene is full of foreboding, as the viewer knows the dire events that were about to follow. Both Achilles and Ajax are in full military uniform, but they are huddled around playing dice to pass the time. This vase uses visual devices to attract the viewer's attention to the game by bending the poses of the two seated warriors to echo the bulging curve of the base, and the shield set behind them fill out the frame. Ezechius continues this tragic tale in another piece, called The Suicide of Ajax, located in Boulogne. Although Ajax was Achilles' cousin, after his death, the Greeks awarded Achilles' armor to Odysseus, rather than Ajax. Humiliated and devastated, Ajax committed suicide by falling on his sword. Again, Ezechius chose a moment where we knew the outcome, Ajax set aside his helmet, shield, and spear, and is setting up the sword and a small mound of earth to fall upon. In addition to scenes of Greek mythology, pottery of the 6th century BC slowly began to promote new motifs of everyday life and social commentary, most of which focused on the activities of young upper-class males. Typically portrayed were general scenes of athletics, horsemanship, and drinking parties, as well as school scenes and music lessons. Women are represented less often than men. They appear either as servants and flute girls or as well-dressed upper-class women accompanied by their female slaves in a domestic setting. Some vases show them chatting at fountain houses on hydriae, or water jars, which they would use to fill up with water at said fountain houses. Such scenes evidently reflect their newfound enthusiasm for public works that were being developed throughout the Greek world. Other scenes show cobblers at work in their shops fishermen returning with their catches, and butchers plying their trade. The archaic potters were proud of their work, frequently signing their vases, such as, so-and-so made me. Many vessels were left unsigned, however. But vases painted by the same artist can nonetheless often be recognized by the diagnosis of character traits and similar styles. An anonymous artist receives his name for various reasons, like a place where his work was popular, or where his work was found. In the case of the Amasis painter, he received his name because only the potter, Amasis, signed his name, and we do not know the name of the actual painter. It could also have been Amasis, but unlike Ezechius, he did not sign his name as both. In the last third of the 6th century BC, some vase painters moved away from the black figure technique and began to create works in red figure. They still used pots of reddish-orange clay and slipped fire black, but essentially they reversed the technique. The artist first drew outlines in the original color of the clay, and then the background of the pot was filled in with black slip and the positive areas, like figures and decoration, were left unpainted. He then painted the details in black, with a fine brush. This allowed a more subtle and refined rendering of detail than the incised black figure technique. It is the Andokides painter who is most often thought of as the inventor of red figure as he demonstrated his versatility by decorating pots on one side with the old-fashioned black figure technique, and on the other side in the new red figure technique. Such pots are called bilinguals. One example is the amphora of Heracles, driving a sacrificial bull, housed at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, dated to around 525 BC. Following him were a group of painters, known as the Pioneers, because of their daring attempts at new poses and views. They show awkward postures and emotional states in precisely anatomical details. This enthusiasm for the body in motion would be an influence on sculpture in the classical period. They knew one another's work well, and occasionally included a taunt to their rival on the vase, 
saying, so-and-so never managed anything like this. Two of the more famous pioneers were Euphronius and Euthymides. One famous example of Euphronius is the Sarpedon Crater, dated to around 515 BC. It is found with no damage at all, a rarity for the ancient world. On the rim, there is an uninterrupted band of palmettes that encircle the vase. The subject is Sarpedon, the son of Zeus and Europa, who was killed at Troy by Patrocles, the friend of Achilles. At his death, Zeus was stricken by grief. In order to ensure a decent burial for his son, Zeus ordered Hypnos, or sleep, and Thanatos, or death, the winged twin sons of the night, to carry him to his homeland for a hero's funeral. We see him here on the vase being gently lifted off of the ground, directed by Hermes, the messenger god. His attributes are a winged hat and a staff with coiled snakes at the top. Here he is shown in his alternate role as the guide who leads souls to the underworld. Fine lines are used to portray intricate details of the wings, hair, drapery, and musculature of all figures to make a dramatic, energetic composition. Euphronius also used the technique of foreshortening, meaning he depicted objects proceeding in space to create the illusion of depth. Another important red figure vase is the Amphora of Euthymides, called the Three Revelers, dated to around 510 BC, and found in Munich. It portrays three drunken men, giving Euthymides an excuse to experiment with the human form by contorting and twisting it in an unnatural state. By the end of the 6th century BC, all the necessary skills had been acquired to render public buildings in stone, dense with sculptural decoration, to sculpt realistic human figures that move naturalistically, either in the round or in the relief and to paint pots with equally convincing figures moving in the illusion of three-dimensional space. The period of experimentation had passed. The following century would see Greek art mature, but we will continue our coverage of the evolution of Greek art and architecture once we get to the classical period. On the next episode, we are going to continue our cultural tour of the Greek Renaissance and turn our attention back to the colonies, particularly those in Ionia and Magna Graecia where huge developments were taking place in the realms of writing and intellectual thought. So join us next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 18, From Epic to Lyric. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes onto your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you're checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks everyone for your continued support, and I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled Epitaph of Sekalos from his album The Ancient Greek Liar. If you like what you heard or are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientliar.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.